Pastor Will. Thanks, man. I'm just going to invite you guys, if we can stay standing a little bit longer this morning, I'd like to start with some scripture reading. And it's a really good practice to bring reverence to the Word of God. So would you join with me this morning? I understand some of you might not be able to stand for extended periods, but if you could stand as we read um, the scripture this morning, just as the guys get that ready. Here we go. So this is in the, if you go to the New Testament, this is the fourth uh, book. It's the Gospel of John. And at the very start of the Gospel of John, it says this. It says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Skip forward to verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And John 15, 9, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. So abide and live in my life. Last thing I want us to do before we sit down is Alicia did this a couple of weeks ago. She sang, Jesus loves me. And it was just something really powerful that I believe that God wants to bring to us today. And so rather than just have me sing this, I'd like to invite us all. Um, I'm sure most of us should know this little ditty. Um, let's sing this together, all right? Ready? One, two, three. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Heavenly Father, this morning as we commit ourselves before you, we ask that you would make us fully aware of your love. Lord, that you gave yourself for us and in every way have shown us love. May we receive it in the full measure today. God, I pray for an encounter and an experience with your presence today that is unmistakable. Change our lives forever from this day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. What we see in that bit of scripture, as John begins to unpack the very potency and importance of the mission of Jesus Christ, he starts off by talking about the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And it was the word that was with God, was God. And it talks about, and then in verse 10 it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. This is Jesus Christ himself. And as we were singing this a couple of weeks ago, and I began to ponder, why is it that sometimes I forget how much Jesus loves me? There are times in my life where I feel 
unworthy, where I feel unloved, where I feel really down and out. And I realized that the very last sentence in that song has so much revelation. The Bible tells me so. It's the Bible that tells me so. And I began to reflect about my moments of brokenness, my areas of forgetfulness, is as I've forgotten how much Jesus loves me. I've allowed other messages to choke out the truth that Jesus loves me. I either haven't spent the time renewing my mind in the Word of God, or I've forgotten and I've allowed other messages to overcome it and overwhelm it, or I've heard the Word and I've deliberately moved against it. The times of biggest brokenness in my life is when God spoke to me personally and through the Bible and said, Will, this is not for you. And I continued in my ways. And I experienced a season of such anguish and hurt that it felt like nobody was there with me and nobody was on my side. You know what happened? I forgot that Jesus loves me. And I can guarantee that you've had a moment in your life where you either haven't known or you've forgotten that Jesus loves you. And maybe you're here today and you're experiencing that yourself. And my hope and prayer is that you would personally encounter and experience the incredible love of Jesus today. And you would take that with you everywhere you go. Such a powerful, powerful thing. Love of Jesus. You know, reading the Bible is like putting fuel in your car. And especially at the moment with the price of fuel, you can begin to wonder, will my car really stop working if I don't fill it up? It's never happened before. I've gotten close before. I'm the sort of guy that I'm like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know the fuel light that comes on in your car? I'm like, no. Oh. This car is run by the power of the Holy Spirit. The amount of times I've prayed to make it to the next service station. But I've never run out of fuel. I'm beginning to wonder if there's just, if this is a real thing, if someone's just trying to take my money for nothing. We're just filling our tank full of air. But I'm not willing to tempt it. But how often are we not running on the fuel that God has given us to run our life and wondering why we're p -p 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 splattering on empty and got nothing left to give? And we feel completely desolate and without because we keep passing the fuel station of the Word of God of being reminded of how much Jesus loves us and how to do things. You know, communication is the key to any and every relationship. Pastor Alicia and I have been married now for 15 years, nearly four anniversaries, which is pretty exciting. We get one every four years because we got married on a leap year. I've never forgotten one. Thank you, Jesus. And I've learned that communication is key to any relationship, and it's no different to our relationship with God. And there's, in my journey, in my relationship with God, I've found that there's three keys in particular that help me to make sure I'm in good communication with God. And a couple of them we've been speaking about already this year. Last week, I was speaking about prayer, the prominence of prayer and, and how Jesus prayed and invited his disciples to partner with him in prayer and the value of prayer. And at the, throughout the start of the year, we were talking a lot about the primary language of God. And this is a new thing for me, because in case you haven't noticed, I like to talk, and a lot. Is the primary language of God is silence. And there's so much value 
in dedicating yourself in silence and stillness before God and allowing him to speak not just through his words and word, but also through silence. But the third one, so we've got silence, we've got prayer, but the third way, the third key to great communication with God, anyone guess what it's going to be? It's the Bible. It's the Bible. It's reading the Bible, and that is what we're talking about today, is about falling in love with the Bible, falling in love with Jesus, because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to read Scripture. And so I want to just unpack this a little bit for us today and, um, and, and lean in on that. Look, just as a little bonus as well, I've got to say one of the greatest ways of being able to fall in love with Jesus is learning how to worship. And as a man, this can be quite challenging because I don't know if girls have got this thing of... of I've never gone to the other side to work it out. Um, but us guys have got this thing with how we look and how things, and we've got to be manly. And worship in church has always been a bit of a challenge for me to work out how to appropriate that. But I'm finding the more I can let go of what I'm worried about, how I look or what other people will think, the more I'm able to connect with God the more I'm able to reciprocate love for him, the more easy it is for me to be able to read scripture. So learning to worship has been absolutely incredible um, for me to develop my relationship with God. So there's a a bonus one. Uh, We're not going to be talking about that any further today, but just one I wanted to drop with you. So I just want to talk about communication really quickly because I believe that in integrating those three areas of silence and stillness, of prayer and of Bible reading and integrating this into our lives regularly, in fact, can I invite you to do it daily, is going to transform your life and help you to be a lot less forgetful about how much Jesus loves you. And you know you what? You live your life differently when you're living out of the revelation and the conviction that Jesus loves you. When you're feeling unlovable, you act a little bit unlovable, and it shows. I'm speaking for myself here. I've had the feedback, and uh, I'm, I'm on a journey to change, and I'm inviting you all into that. So here's a little bit of some stats and figures around messages. Now, this may be just in the US. I couldn't work out if it was just in the US or worldwide, but either way, the numbers are staggering. 18.7 billion text messages are sent every day. 60 billion messages are sent via apps every day. Now, just some SMS stats. On average, of those aged between 18 and 24, 128 text messages are sent every day. And for any parents of teenagers, it probably involves one letter every text message. Whereas those of us old enough remember how much each text message costed, and we have a bit more of an economy of text messages. And it goes, uh, for those up to 35 years old, they send about 70 text messages a day, and those up to 55 send about 16 text messages a day. I'm talking just text messages here. This doesn't encount, um, or encompass email messages, the messages that we're getting from social media, from billboards, from conversations with real-life people in person, like people still actually converse today as well, uh, which is awesome. There's so many messages that we're getting on a daily basis. How many of them are reminding you that Jesus loves you? How many of them are reminding you of the goodness of God? How many of them are reminding you of who you are in Christ Jesus? If it's anything like me, probably not very many. Every now and then I'll get an encouragement, someone saying they're praying for me, reminding me of something. Those are really powerful. But overall, it's kind of a bit of a mixed message, really, isn't it? We're getting so many messages, but not many aren't the ones that are going to help us to understand God's love for us. So if you want to be able to understand and to discern the voice of God, you must know The voice of God. As I was saying before, Alicia and I, we've been married 15 years. I know her voice. Actually, 
If someone else comes and says something to me, I'll know if Alicia sent them because of what they've said. We finish each other's sandwiches. For those that don't follow Frozen, sentences. We, I know what she's thinking. I know what she does. And I can be in a conversation with anyone. It doesn't matter how important you are or think you are. If I hear Alicia laughing, even if I didn't know that she was in the room, that sound to me is so distinctive, and it's one of my favorite things about you, Alicia. Still makes my heart flutter. <laughs> Everything stops. I, you no longer have my attention. And because I know her sound, and I know, and because we have an intimate relationship, I'm, I'm thinking of Alicia. I'm no longer thinking about whoever I'm talking about. Is it like this when Jesus speaks to us? Because I know for me, if I'm up to mischief, if I'm up to trouble, if I'm doing something and Jesus is trying to speak to me and say, hey, Will, not the best thing to say right now. It's not always my heart beating with admiration at hearing the sound of my Savior. Sometimes it's like, shush, just let me get myself into more trouble and put both feet right in there. But when we understand the voice of Jesus and we, we desperately and want to connect with him intimately and, and know his voice and hear it, we have that same encounter and we have that same experience that will stop us in our tracks and make our heart beat that little bit faster once again. And we can know God's voice, as, we, as I was saying before, in those three areas of communication is dedicating some time for silence and stillness. It's confronting it first, but it's so incredibly powerful and freeing. And not just needing him to remind us with words of how much he loves us, but just being with him. Because anyone in a romantic relationship knows that it's as much about the words that are said as the space between the words and spending the time with the one that you love. And so there's something powerful and valuable from, and I would encourage, I was never taught this in church. So young people, learn to spend time sitting before God still and silently. Do that for a couple of minutes. It will change your life. And if you can develop that habit at a young age, man, it's going to be absolutely incredible for you. Also young people and older young people. Learning to pray. You know, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. Jesus also prayed, and in that, gave us an example of how we should pray. Like, that message last week, I was so blown away with how Jesus prayed. And even Jesus was okay with having one of his prayers not answered. Father, take this cup from me. Here's my desire, I'm submitting it before you, and I'm okay even if you don't grant what it is that I ask of you. How to pray powerfully is such an incredible thing, and of course, learning how to read scripture is just one of the most incredible things. You see, reading scripture, we can see how Jesus loves especially reading the Gospels, we can see how in every interaction, even when he was correcting and addressing people, how he did everything through love. And we can see how he loved them then, but through the power of the Holy Spirit as we read Scripture, it begins to show us and remind us how he loves us here and now. And as I read Scripture and as I open it up and I'm like, God, I don't understand that, I'm just going to give it some space. Can you speak to me? And I begin to get this stirring in my heart and reminding again, Will, hey, buddy, I need you to know something really important. I love you so much. Oh, but God, I'm this, this, and this. Hey, Will, I need you to know something. I love you so much. Oh, but God, didn't you see that right then? Hey, Will, buddy, 
before anything else, I need you to know this. I love you so much. One of my favorite scriptures is in Romans. It says, in whilst we were sinners, Christ died for us. There's something powerful about not having to earn the love of God, about being able to appreciate it. I'm just so incredibly thankful that Jesus valued me and came to rescue me. In the book of John, it gives us a couple of other bits of reminders. And red letters means that this is Jesus speaking. And it says here, John 10, 27. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you're his, you'll know his voice. The desire of Jesus is that you would recognize him. That you would be waiting to hear his voice. That it would make your heart quicken when he speaks to you. John 14 verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. I was sharing earlier, right at the start of the message, one of the moments where I find disconnect with the truth that Jesus loves me is when I've operated contrary to what Scripture instructs me. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you're anything like me, then you find it much easier to fall into the things you shouldn't be doing than to keep doing the things you should be doing. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes really eloquently about that. Keep doing the things I shouldn't be doing, the things I want to be doing, I don't seem to do. But he continues, thank you, God, that I'm not who I was, but you're making me into a new creation. And God, you're giving me the power to be able to follow your instructions. In verse 21, it says, Jesus speaking says, He who has my commandments and keeps them. Something powerful about when you read the word of God is asking Holy Spirit to give you the power to apply that. It's like a prescription. You get the medication, but you need to do something with it. It's like a gym membership. You can pay for the membership. But you've got to work out. And Jesus has given us the fuel for our vehicles to keep chugging along on this road of life. But we've got to put it into the car. and We've got to turn the car on. We've got to put it into action. If you keep my commandments, that's who loves me, Jesus says. And whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And this is something that is transformative, friends. Jesus says, I will manifest myself to him. What does that mean? I will appear as real to that person. Oh, man, who needs some real Jesus in their life? All you people need Jesus. Seriously, I need Jesus. I need some more Jesus in my life. Real Jesus. I'm not talking about Bobby Boucher, baby Jesus, and praying as funny prayer on the movies that they do. I'm talking about real Jesus. I'm talking about this Jesus who lived a real life, who was born of flesh, who lived in 30, he did three years of ministry that turned this world upside down. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. And he said, those that follow me, greater signs and wonders will follow those that believe in me. Do you believe, church? I need some real Jesus transformation happening in my life. This community needs some real Jesus transformation happening in those that have an encounter with the love of Jesus and their life is turned upside down, never to be the same ever again. Who needs some of that Jesus? Come on, Lord, we need you today. Hallelujah. And look, the good news is, um, we're talking surveys, the NCLS says that 98, let's have a look, prayer, private devotion, here we go, 96% of our church is spending time in prayer, Bible reading, or meditation at least weekly. That's awesome. So clearly what I'm, excuse me, what I'm speaking about this morning isn't a foreign concept to you guys. It's something that at least at some level you're believing 96% of the people that did this survey uh, a year and a half ago 
uh, regularly, at least weekly, spending time in prayer, Bible reading, meditation being that silence and stillness, sitting before God. But here's something I just want to, um, and here's every day or most days is 64%, um, a few times a week. And so all these mean is this is where we are now, this is where we were last time, and this is what our denomination on average is, if you're just wondering what they are. Um, if you like to look at stats more than, than listening, that's, that's up there for you. But here's something I just want to um, point out. is an even higher figure, 98% of people that did this survey, and I'd probably suggest that 98% of this room would suggest, that 98% of us agree or strongly agree that faith influences decision and actions in daily life, as well as that faith is an important part of who they are. So as a whole, nearly every single person wholeheartedly ascribes to the fact that the faith that we have, the beliefs that we have, determine the actions that we make and our identity. My question comes, if we're not Spending regular time in the Word of God, where are we getting our faith from? What is determining our faith that is determining our actions and our identity? And I go back to my reflection at the very start of the message, is how real this has been at work in my life, that when I'm not spending time in the Word and giving time for the word to change and transform me, I find my identity is under attack. I don't like who I am. I don't know who I am because my identity is being formed and made by the many other messages and mixed messages that are coming at me all throughout the day. If I'm not giving myself to the renewing of my mind through the word of God, all of my actions and my identity is being formed. But is it being formed in the way that I believe that Jesus wants it to? You know, last weekend we celebrated that Jesus is alive. Do you believe it? Jesus is alive. And can I say that Jesus is alive? The word is not dead. The word is not irrelevant. The word is not for a time 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. The word is for today. The word was written by them, for them then, but transforms us today. The book of Hebrews, man, is powerful. The book of Hebrews was written for Jewish believers that were coming to know Jesus Christ. It's one of the most powerful books of the Bible that you can read because it helps us to understand why the Old Testament is still important and relevant. That there's nuggets of, of wisdom and understanding and setup of why Jesus had to do what he did. You don't just read only the New Testament. Here's, here's the New Testament, this little section here. Here's the Old Testament. There's value in this whole book to transform your life. In fact, in Hebrews, it says that the word of God is alive. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. The word of God is alive and it's powerful and it's active and it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it'll divide between bone and marrow. That's how precise it is. Anyone needing some precision in the decisions they're making at the moment, get yourself in the Word of God and believe by the Holy Spirit that your mind and your heart will be transformed and God will lead you according to His Word. That bit of Scripture is Hebrews 4.12 in case you're wondering. So if reading the Bible has become a chore for you, if you're struggling with how to read the Bible, then let's work with you on that. Let's pray with you on that. Because the enemy, if reading the Bible is so transformative, he's not going to let you get away with it easily. But so what? There's many hard things that we do in life that we know are for our benefit. We've just got to know that it's beneficial enough to do it. So I want to encourage you. 
I've got a bunch of Bibles up the front here. If you don't have a Bible ready and handy at the moment, or if you'd like a new King James Version, I'd love to write a message in the front of it, or have one of our, one of our leaders write a message in the front, personalize it for you, and give that to you. We've got a couple of them available. If anyone needs a Bible, please grab one after the service. If the Bible you're reading at the moment, you're struggling to understand, you want a study Bible, come and talk to us and we'll, we'll research with you to find which study Bible would be the most beneficial for you. I want you to engage in the Bible because it's not coming to church on Sunday that's going to transform your life. This is just a little pep talk and encouragement so that when you go out during the week, you can empower yourself through the Spirit of God and be anointed by Him you're like personally, church is to empower the saints for the work of the ministry, not to get pastor to do all of the work of the ministry. This is part of why we're shifting the way we're doing kids' church and things. It's to empower families to work ministry. It's because we believe what we talk about, and so we've got to change the way we act as a result. We've got to get passionate about reading the Scripture. It's God's gift to us. It's His handwritten letter, hand-delivered in person. I love you, He says, over and over and over again. And just in case the enemy's tried to trip you up and tell you that the, the Bible's not relevant... There's one digital version of the Bible called YouVersion. Now, um, Pastor Craig Rochelle, it's his church. He's my, he's my favorite pastor. If, if I'm looking for some encouragement or, or some type of thing, I love Pastor Craig Rochelle's stuff. His church, Life Church, through there, they launched this app called YouVersion. If you want a digital Bible, it's free, and it's always going to be free. Why? Because Craig went onto a campus one day and someone gave him a Bible for free, a Gideon's Bible, that changed his life. And he's got passionate about making sure that everyone has access to a Bible. There's reading plans. There's devotionals. You can have the Bible read out for you audibly. And it's free. If you don't have it, get it. But here's some stats on new version. Last year, just last year, the app was opened over 5 billion times. They reached half a billion downloads last year since their launch in 2008. And if you're thinking that the Bible and the interest in the Bible is decreasing, hear this. Cuba last year, their Bible engagement increased by 76%. People are hungry for love, and they're finding it in the Word of God. And if you're feeling lonely and left out, you are going to find transformation in the Word of God. I asked around the church, some of the congregants here, what their experience has been in reading Scripture and it was interesting, not many of them said anything about, oh, when I read scripture, this, this, and this amazing happens, and you know, the Red Sea opens in front of me, and the, and the, 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 um, the M1, all of the cars part. <laughs> not one person has said anything like that. But you know what? They all actually reflected on the fact that when they're not reading it, things get pretty lumpy and bumpy pretty quick. Isn't that interesting? So we can take for granted the level of life that we get from reading the Bible, but we certainly notice it when we're not engaging with it. I want to encourage you. And again, reading the Bible is like giving. And I can speak to you on this because you are a generous church. You're incredibly generous. And you've got the revelation on generosity, not giving out of necessity, not giving out of forcefulness, not giving out of having to or guilting giving, but giving because you want to and growing in your generosity in that way, it's the same with reading scripture. And if at the moment you're only reading it because you have to, pray and ask God to give you a passion and open it up. I've spoken to a few people here and they really struggled reading scripture. And in the last 12, 18 months, they've had an encounter with Holy Spirit who has opened up scripture to them and their life has changed exponentially. 
When you get a revelation about the goodness of God. See, I'm fortunate. I had really mean mum and grandma that made me read four chapters a day. And it was forceful, yes. It was obligation. And sometimes I'd get through it as quick as I could so I could get on with the other things that had nothing to do with the Bible. But you know what? Nothing is ever wasted in the kingdom of God. All things work together for the good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Scripture tells us that. And all of the scripture that I read then, the, I've got this incredible ability of recall of scripture now. I can be in a situation, and I couldn't tell you which verse and chapter it is, but I can speak word for word what scripture says in that moment because God has helped me to draw back on all of that time. None of it's wasted. Even though I was doing it out of forcefulness, it's not wasted. So if you have to read, do it out of forcefulness. But if you're going to, you may as well do it out of gratitude. You may as well do it out of love. You're not going to waste any time reading the Bible even under duress. But there's a much better way of doing it. Can I invite you to get a passion and to fall in love with Jesus? Fall in love with the Word of God. Get expectant. God, I'm so happy to spend time with you, even though today maybe I didn't get anything out of it. I'm just trusting that spending time with you is enough. And I can tell you, friends, it will change your life. I just want to close on a couple of reflections from my good friend, uh, Pastor Andrew Staggs, uh, the Dean of Christian Ministry College. So we're talking a lot about Ministry College at the moment. We've got Pastor Beck Connor from Good Life Ministry College. And I'm talking about Pastor Andrew Staggs here. Here's one of the ways that you can love Scripture more is by studying it. It says, study to find yourselves approved. In fact, one of the things that I'll regularly do in sermons is say something wrong on purpose and hope that you don't agree with me. Because sometimes I'm going to get it wrong not on purpose and I don't want you to agree with me. There's a group of people called the Bereans and it said that when this message was brought, they studied and they leaned in and they wrestled with it so much and they got the revelation for themselves. And church, that's my heart for you. I'm giving you permission to look for areas that you can disagree with me on on my preaching. As long as we do it respectfully. Because I'd love to show you where you're wrong. (laughs) Here's what Pastor Andrew says about how the Word of God has completely transformed his life. You see, as a young person, while he was single, he made his relationship with Scripture. He made that the main point in everything that he did, and he was desperate about having God speak to him. That was all the relationship he needed. And he went to, he, he understood that God went to such great lengths to communicate to him, so he went to great lengths to read the communication about God's love to him. So he devoted himself to the word of God, memorizing verses, highlighting and circling. You know, you're allowed to actually, it's a, it's a workbook and a textbook. If you don't have a Bible at the moment that you feel comfortable to write on, grab one from the church and write all over that. Highlight the junk out of that. Circle that. Engage with it. Write the revelation and date it. So when you're going back through, you're like, thank you, Jesus, for that. Or just buy some notebooks and write in them if you, if you can't write in Scripture. But he says that he also, he did all of those things, but he also made a point of communicating the revelation of God to other people. He did that in small groups and in prayer groups and started to pray Scripture. There you go, friends. You want to get revelation out of Scripture? Try praying through the words of God. Take some of Jesus' words and start praying them and asking them to be applicable in your life. And he began to weep many nights over the beauty of the wonderful words that occur in the Bible, God's love letter. And so he suggests for us, he said, here's a book that he loves, um, that he'd highly recommend. If you're struggling to get stuff out of Scripture, this is by Michael Bird, Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible. Here's the chapters. The Bible didn't fall out of the sky. The Bible is divinely given and humanly Composed. It's an interesting dichotomy. People are like, oh, but if people just wrote it. But it's divinely given, divinely inspired, God himself. Scripture is normative, not negotiable. In our life today, we want to try and say, 
Have you ever seen someone go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Was they trying to take a lid off a jar? It was supposed to twist the jar, not scripture. Um, that's not actually what it means. And so what it's saying here is that we don't get to make scripture say what we want. It's fixed. Um, the Bible is for our time, but it's not about our time. Powerful. Um, we should always take the Bible seriously, but not always literally. Some of them are stories, not history. Um, the purpose of Scripture is knowledge, faith, love, and hope, and Christ is the center of the Christian Bible. Also, there's um, engaging in the Old Testament. That's one of my favorite things. People who live out the Old Testament are leaving out some of the greatest love letters that God has for them. So can I encourage you, grab a word for today. I know Greg goes to great lengths to make sure that we have multiple copies of Word for Today, which are great devotionals that help you to get more out of the Scripture you read. Can you get yourself a Bible, a study Bible? I will pull out whatever stops we need to to get you passionate about engaging in the Word of God because I know how much it's going to change your life. Why don't we stand right now? I just want you to be thinking about some practical tips before we pray. Practice reading your Bible. Practice reading it, even if it's not working. Just do it out of practice. It's like a habit. You just practice it. You warm it up. You get into it, like fueling your car. Even if you don't think the fuel's working, do it anyway. Do it with joy and expectation. Number two, set yourself up well. Resource yourself. Get the right material. Get yourself accountability. Get yourself a communication plan. How much are you wanting to be communicating with God? Research the sermon. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. Grab a hold of the scriptures that we go through and get God to wrestle that with you. Be Berean. And here's the main thing, friends. Can you remember today that Jesus loves you? Can you remember today that Jesus loves you? Lord God, right now, I pray for your great love. Touch every young person, every older person, every person in between. My God, I've had some times in my life where I have deserted your love and I've just been in a des desert of lovelessness. I've felt dry and miserable and I've acted that way. I need your love. Lord, give me a passion for scripture today. Give me a passion for Jesus. Give me a revelation of how much you love me and transform me in that. I stand against every word of guilt right now in the name of Jesus. Every word of condemnation that says, I don't deserve the love of God. I don't and I don't care. I'm coming anyway. Because your love is bigger than my deserving. Your love goes beyond anything I could do to earn it and you came anyway. So would you overcome every obstacle today to receiving your love? Transform me in your love and empower me to share your love with every single person I come into contact with that needs to know that they're loved deeply by God. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, maybe today you're here and you're actually still struggling to believe that Jesus loves you. Maybe you've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life. I want to make it really easy for you this morning because I know I need to make a commitment to Jesus regularly. So we're all as a family going to say this prayer, and I invite you to join with us. And if you're saying it for the first time or if you're making a commitment today to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, please come and see one of our leaders because we would love to partner with you on your journey and have this transform your life. Would you pray after me, church? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your love. I pray today that you would change my life. That you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. That you would heal me by Jesus Christ. Jesus, I need you. I can't do this myself. I want to walk with you.